Going to our nation's national parks these days, let's be honest, can be a pretty exhausting experience. After your long drive to get to the national park, upon entering the national park, you realize that there is something you never wanted to see upon going out into what you thought would be the woods or wilderness, and that is traffic, lots of traffic, and not just vehicle traffic, but human traffic. Our nation's parks are more congested than ever. They're handling amounts of people that the infrastructure was not designed to handle and that the natural environment was not designed to handle. The National Park Service and the park rangers do their best to manage the enormous crowds that our parks attract, but there's only so much they can do, which is why a lot of national parks will close during their high seasons during the day to new visitors. It's tragic, but it's just kind of inevitable. We live in a very busy world, a world that demands more from a human being than ever. You are asked to be constantly connected to the grid. And so a lot of people, maybe they just need a break from that. Maybe not for very long, maybe just for a week or even a weekend. And to do that, they think that going to our nation's parks is going to be the way to do that. Unfortunately, that is often just not the case. You're not going to get that experience of being alone in solitude in the woods in many of our nation's most popular parks. It's not to say that these parks are bad or that you shouldn't visit them. It's just there's a lot more that goes into visiting these places than you might have expected. And it can provide a pretty frustrating experience if you didn't know that that's what you were going to encounter. But let's say you do want to visit a national park for what you think a national park should serve, which is a place away from the world, a place away from crowds and as much as that's possible, a place that is removed from the modern world. What park can provide that experience? On your screen is Gates of the Arctic National Park. It is the second biggest national park by area. It is only just barely behind Wrangell St. Ellis, which is in lower Alaska, while Gates of the Arctic rests in northern Alaska. It is bigger than many of our nation's states, and yet it receives less than 10,000 visitors a year. Gates of the Arctic National Park is characterized by massive peaks from the Brooks Mountain Range, many meandering, beautiful, mighty rivers, and lakes that don't even have names. And many of these lakes have probably, honestly, never even been visited by an American citizen. Now, you might wonder, well, with a place so beautiful and so untouched, how is this place not crowded and filled to the brim with people wearing Patagonia jackets and Carhartt beanies? Well, there is no official infrastructure leading into the park. You're not going to get your Subaru Forester in the gates of the Arctic National Park. There are no roads in or out. The only reliable and safe way into the park is by bush plane. You could hypothetically backpack your way into the park, which that alone would be an adventure in and of itself. I've never read about anyone doing that. That would be really cool. If anyone knows of anyone who's do, done that, please let me know in the comments. But as far as I'm aware, the only people in the modern era that go to Gates of the Arctic get there by boat, which is a very long journey, or by plane. You will land probably on a lake with a float plane. You will be dropped off. And assuming you're doing a backpacking trip, you'll be picked up anywhere between seven to 10 days from now, depending on the weather. Oh, that's right. The weather here can be so chaotic during the summer months that sometimes bush pilots will be a day or two late to picking you up. So you are advised by park rangers to pack in as much food as possible and as much extra gear as possible. You might need to subsist on the land for a minute if your plane is late. This landscape is covered by snow from anywhere from seven to nine months out of the year and is really only accessible in the mid to late summer months. But during this period, if you're able to manage it, if you are able to get into the park, you will most likely be the only person for not just tens of miles, but hundreds of miles. Keep in mind that hunting is completely off limits in our nation's national park. So there's no hunters or miners or anybody else in that park. The only people that are in that landmass are people who want to be there to experience it. And just look at the mighty landscape. This gives a very good idea of what most of North America looked like during the Ice Age. 
flat tundra surrounded by enormous jagged peaks that have been carved by glaciers. I mean, it is just magnificent. The type of wildlife you will encounter here will be primarily caribou, and there are tons of caribou bones littering the landscape as the great caribou herd has migrated through this area for tens of thousands of years. It is home to grizzly bears, black bears, all the expected species of Arctic foxes, otters, the Arctic species of uh, raptors, predatory birds, and there are even rumors of polar bears being in gates of the Arctic. I can't really find a good source for this, but honestly, I don't know if there's any way to really know one way or the other. That would be, I mean, kind of nuts that the polar bears would live that far inland. So probably not true, but it is fun to imagine considering they are North America's largest carnivore. When you visit this national park, you will, as I've already stated, be surrounded by soaring mountain peaks, the vast majority of which have not been peaked by anybody uh, that we know of in the last 10,000 years. But what's fun about Gates of the Arctic is that although it's so desolate and there's no one around, it's simultaneously been visited and inhabited by humans for at least 10,000 years. They have found arrowheads, primitive tools, and when you find these, that means that you are not the first person to be here. Someone else has been there, treaded that insane climate, has contended with the challenges that come with this aggressive yet majestic landscape. It's a way of connecting with our human past in a way that's just so visceral and real. It's one thing to read about what our ancestors, the ancient humans, did. It's one thing to read about that and imagine yourself in their shoes. But it's one thing to be basically in their shoes, literally standing what, where they stood as they looked at across the enormous tundra plains that surround this great landmass. At night, you will be treated to a crystal clear sky, most likely filled with aurora borealis. And a clear view of the Arctic night sky is something that I pray to God I will be able to see myself one day. It is something that just can't be replaced by a camera. In the ancient world and in many ancient cultures, they had places that we would call temples. Places that once you fulfilled some kind of purification process, you were allowed to enter and feel the presence of a god or a spirit or a creator. A place where you could be still, meditate, be born again, and think upon the meaning of being alive, the meaning of consciousness, the meaning of being a created being. Since the French Revolution, in the modern world, we aren't really allowed to have places like that. Spirituality is relegated to crazy people or the hyper-rich. However, Gates of the Arctic National Park, in my opinion, you could describe as some kind of a temple. The purity ritual that you have to go to to get here is not a moral one or even really a spiritual one. It just boils down to effort. Yes, there are few visitors that come here because it is extraordinarily difficult to get the time and money together to go. But if you are able to accomplish that ritual, if you are able to sacrifice the time and the money and the effort necessary to come here, in my opinion, you will probably have a life-changing experience. It seems to be the case that of the few people who visit Gates of the Arctic National Park, they leave as changed people. They leave with a new appreciation, not just for this planet, but for themselves, for the lives that they lead. Hiking and being in the woods generally can heal all sorts of mental illnesses very quickly, almost overnight. And going here would be like a mental health baptism. Assuming you go prepared and that you're smart and you're not stupid and you respect the land and the animals and that they can kill you whenever they want as long as you don't have any means to stop them. As long as you respect the landscape. I imagine that going here is the closest you can have to a mental and spiritual baptism outside of a religion. It's a place that I pray I will be able to experience one day. It is one of the last sacred places on earth. It's interesting. It's really hard to find content on Gates of the Arctic National Park. You'll notice I've had to reuse stock footage in this video. That's because there's just so little about this place because no one goes there. 
I hope that by making this YouTube video, I have not desecrated this landscape further. I hope that if more people do go here, they go with respect, in reverence, and with a sacredness in their heart for the land on which they stand.